From the beginning of this crisis, Donald Trump has been saying a lot of not smart things. He said the coronavirus will disappear like a miracle. He said people had nothing to lose by experimenting with hydroxychloroquine. And he even said that the virus can't see you if you don't move. I think he was confusing it with Jurassic Park. But a few days ago, as you've probably heard by now, President Trump created shockwaves of stupidity with his latest and probably greatest unlicensed medical opinion yet. President Trump offering new but unproven suggestions of how to kill COVID-19 in patients using UV rays and injecting disinfectants such as bleach and alcohol. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. And I think you said that hasn't been checked, but you're gonna test it. And then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. And I think you said you're going to test that too. Sounds interesting. And then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning so that you're going to have to use medical doctors with, but it sounds, it sounds interesting to me. This is maybe the first time in documented history that we've seen someone not thinking out loud, injecting disinfectant into your body. This is the problem when the dumbest person in the room thinks they're the smartest person. You know, Trump is like Neville Longbottom, but with Hermione's confidence. And, and I almost don't even blame Trump because there's no way he even understands what bleach is. Like, do you think Donald Trump has ever cleaned anything in his life? Do you think he's ever actually used disinfectant? Cleaning supplies might as well be magical potions to him. I dropped a hamburger on the carpet. Then some Mexican lady came in with some Clorox, sprayed it on the carpet, said some spell in Spanish, and then it was gone. Now, as crazy as the disinfectant line was, I don't think we should be so quick to dismiss Trump's UV light idea. Because Trump, spends most of his time under UV lights. And other than looking like hickory smoked bacon, he's the healthiest man in the world. I mean, he's even outlived Kim Jong-un, a man half his age. Prove me wrong, Kim. If you're still alive, follow me back on Twitter. Now, if you're some random guy on the internet with 12 followers, you can say shit like this and it really doesn't matter. You can say whatever you want about coronavirus. But Donald Trump is not just some random guy. Donald Trump was the star of Celebrity Apprentice. People listen to what he says. So his suggestion about injecting people with a disinfectant has had a massive fallout. The suggestion of ingesting disinfectants, something that would be dangerous and even deadly, has sparked a backlash. Lysol's parent company issued a statement saying, quote, under no circumstances should our disinfectant products be administered into the human body. We have heard from emergency management in various states that they have had a remarkable uptick in the number of calls, mostly, thankfully, from people who are just calling to see whether it's true, whether they should consume or ingest uh, disinfectants. We had hundreds of calls uh, in, our, in our hotline here in Maryland about people asking about injecting or ingesting uh, these, uh, these uh, disinfectants, which is uh, you know, hard, to, hard to imagine that people thought that that was serious, but, but people actually were uh, thinking about this. Was this something you could do to protect yourself? Yep, this is where we are now. Authorities have to respond to the president's ideas the same way they do to viral TikTok challenges. And honestly, I love that people were actually calling, calling their local health departments to ask if they should try to cure themselves with disinfectants. Because that means that even the people who are dumb enough to drink bleach are still smart enough not to trust something Donald Trump said. I mean, I was gonna do it, but now that he said it, I'm not so sure. Now, as always, when Trump says something insane about the coronavirus, it puts his team of doctors in a tight spot because they have to try and correct him without embarrassing him. And no one tries harder than Dr. Burks. You didn't believe the president was putting anybody in danger, did you? 
No, when he gets new information, he likes to talk that through out loud um, and really have that dialogue. And so that's what dialogue he was having. I think he just saw the information at the time, um, immediately before the press conference, and he was still digesting that information. Bravo, Dr. Burks. Bravo. It is a great defense to not use the word dumb, but just describe what being dumb is to describe Trump. She's like, no, of course the president is not a stupid man. He's just a man who thinks that night happens when God turns the sun off. Now, while, while Dr. Burks was trying to soften the blow, most of Trump's defenders, they were doubling down. Oh, you liberals missed the point. Trump is thinking outside the box. This is actually a genius idea when you think about it. But this was priceless. After Trump's supporters spent the entire day defending him, the president went back on TV to make his fans look like idiots too. Can you clarify your comments about injections of disinfectant? They're, they're quite no, I was asking a question sarcastically to reporters like you just to see what would happen. Now, disinfectant for doing this maybe on the hands would work. And I was asking the question of the gentleman who was there yesterday, Bill, but I was asking a sarcastic and a very sarcastic question to the reporters in the room about disinfectant on the inside, but it does kill it and it would kill it on the hands and that would make things much better. That was done in the form of a sarcastic question to the reporters. Okay, come on. We all saw Trump's presser and we all know it wasn't sarcasm. Sarcasm is when you make fun of something by saying the opposite of what you mean. You can't just use that as an excuse for when you messed up. My final answer is B. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's wrong. I was just being sarcastic. I can't believe you thought that that was my final answer. <laughs> like of all time. Wow. I'm gonna go with C. <laughs> Actually, sarcasm again. Let's try A, and if not, sarcasm means it's D. And my favorite part of that excuse was how Trump tried to have it both ways at the same time. Because he says, he says his suggestion was sarcastic, but then he immediately goes on to explain why it also makes sense. Trump suggests injecting bleach the way other people try and float a threesome. Obviously, I'm joking, babe. I like, don't want a threesome with Johnny. I'm just, like, unless he's into it. But, like, no, <laughs> it was just a joke. Come on. You're all I need. And Johnny, just joking. So, now we've learned something new from Donald Trump. While the nation is tuning into these briefings for accurate information, Trump is just testing out his newest comedy material and pulling everyone's leg. Supposing we hit the body with a tremendous, uh, whether it's ultraviolet or just very powerful light. <laughs> then I said, supposing you brought the light inside the body, you can, which you can do either through the skin or uh, in some other way. <laughs> and then I see the disinfectant where it knocks it out in a minute, one minute. And is there a way we can do something like that uh, by injection inside or, or almost a cleaning, because you see it gets on the lungs and it does a tremendous number in the lungs, so it'd be interesting to check that. The one upside of this whole debacle is that Donald Trump has given Americans the perfect excuse, the perfect excuse for electing him. Because when all of this is over and other countries are asking Americans, how the hell did you elect Donald Trump? Americans can be like, no, dude, dude. We were just being sarcastic. Apple, the world's biggest tech giant and smallest producer of apples. Because this pandemic has forced people to wear masks all the time, a lot of iPhone users have noticed that unlocking your phone with your face doesn't work anymore. And I mean, it makes sense. You have a mask on, so the phone can't recognize you. Hell, nobody can recognize you, except that guy at the bank who says he somehow recognized me. <laughs> and then the jury bought his story. <sighs> Three years later, here we are. Anyway. It's being reported that Apple is about to launch a new feature to fix this problem by letting people punch in a secret code that unlocks the phone. Yeah. And I know, I know what the haters are gonna say. Oh, we had this technology years ago. Yeah, exactly. This is the genius of Apple. They're trying to take us back in time because if we're back in time, there's no Corona and Cheryl hasn't broken up with me. Please, Cheryl, you gotta take me back. The woman in the background, I swear, I don't know who she was. I think she was like a robber. The only reason she was naked is because she was probably stealing clothes. 
please take me back, Cheryl? <laughs> like I didn't, I just didn't know. In other news, we're going on six weeks of lockdown and it's clearly starting to wear on some people's nerves. People like Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and man who definitely has an escape hatch. He's never been a fan of the shutdown in the first place, but last night he pushed the button for insane mode. Tesla CEO Elon Musk is being criticized after he launched into a rant filled with expletives on Tesla's earnings call. The extension of the shelter in place, uh, or frankly, I would call it forcibly imprisoning people in their homes uh, against all their constitutional rights, that, that my opinion, breaking people's freedoms in ways that are horrible and, and, and wrong, uh, and not why people came to America or built this country. What the f Excuse me. If somebody wants to stay in their house, that's that's great. They should be allowed to stay in their house and they should not be compelled to leave. But to say that they cannot leave their house um, and they will be arrested if they do, this is fascist. Give people back their goddamn freedom. Yes, Elon, finally, finally, someone has decided to call out this fascist American government that's asking people to please stay in their houses to try and save their own lives. I mean, you're not even allowed to go to the grocery store anymore. Well, I mean, actually you can't go to the grocery store, but I mean, you, you can't even go for a walk. I mean, you, you can do that too, but what about the beach? You're not allowed to go to the beach, except for all the states where you're allowed to go to the beach, but you definitely can't go to H&M. And that is the definition of fascism. Now I see what Elon Musk is really doing here. This guy's just trying to stir up civil unrest so that people end up buying one of his bulletproof trucks. We need to rise up to fight the government from inside our cyber trucks now available with full autopilot. You know, the weirdest part about all of this is that Elon Musk always says that we're all living in a computer simulation, but now he's like, yo, yo, the universe might be fake, but my stock price is real. Let's take this shit seriously, people. Speaking of people with no filter, President Trump. A lot of us have always wondered for a long time if Trump actually pays attention to all the tweets that he gets. And it turns out he does bigly. An engineer in California who tweeted the president was paid $69 million for ventilators that never came. On March 27th, President Trump posted on Twitter to urge Ford and General Motors to start making ventilators now. A man named Yaron Oren Pines tweeted back, We can supply ICU ventilators. Have someone call me urgent. And that's all it took. The guy had just 75 followers on Twitter and no apparent experience in manufacturing. But three days later, New York State entered into a $69 million contract with the man. A New York State official said that they entered the contract at the direct recommendation of the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Now New York has terminated the deal and is trying to get its money back. $69 million. Guys, come on. First of all, if someone tells you the price of anything is $69 million, it's a joke. 69 is pranking 101. And second of all, nice. But, but, but hold on, let's go back for a second and just, just, just help me figure this out. Some random guy tweeted President Trump asking him for a ventilator contract and his wish was just granted? Just like that? He said, did I want this thing? And then he got the thing? I mean, let this be a warning. The next time you tweet at the president telling him that you've got Hillary's emails and D's nuts, don't be shocked if Trump shows up to collect. I brought a hammer, so let's smash these nuts and see what's inside them. Last month, Congress passed the Paycheck Protection Program, which set aside $342 billion to help small businesses through the pandemic shutdown. Now, before most small businesses could get any help, that money disappeared faster than Rudy Giuliani and direct sunlight. And because of this, Congress has had to come back with a second round of funding with 310 additional billion dollars. But when it came time to hand it out yesterday, things got off to another rocky start. This morning, millions of small businesses are still waiting for relief. As delays, technical glitches, and overwhelming demand caused the Small Business Administration's portal to crash within minutes of relaunching the new loan funding program. The SBA revealing twice as many people tried to access the program on Monday than at any time during the first round of loans. Many lenders reported not being able to file applications for clients because the computer system kept crashing. God damn it, man. How come it seems like every time the government builds a website, it crashes immediately? Like, I've never 
had this problem with my website, picklesandsocks.com. And don't tell me it's because nobody wants to see photos of Pickles wearing socks. It's adorable. I mean, look at that. Look at that. He's not supposed to be wearing that sock because he's a pickle. <laughs> it's so funny. Now, look, computer errors can be fixed, right? They probably just need to turn it off and turn it back on again. That never works. But there's a bigger problem with the PPP. It turns out that one reason small businesses haven't been able to get their money is because all the big businesses have been snapping it up. We've learned that in round one of the PPP, a whopping 870 million went to publicly traded companies. At least 75 companies that were helped are so big that they're publicly traded and some had market values greater than $100 million. Some of the nation's largest restaurant chains are facing backlash. Shake Shack returning $10 million it received after public outcry. The Los Angeles Lakers organization is the latest not-so-small business to return a government loan. The team received more than $4.5 million in the first round of loans. Lakers are one of the NBA's most profitable franchises, worth more than $4 billion. Yeah. It turns out the companies who are getting a lot of the small business loan money are small in the same way that Joe Exotic is chill. I'll tell you about Carol Baskin. Let me tell you about, and how come I can't say the N word? Even the Los Angeles Lakers got some of that small business money. And I don't care what anybody says. The Lakers do not need $4 million, all right? The Knicks need $4 million to bribe their fans, to act like they don't see what's going on. Now, it is important to remember that although what these big companies did was shitty, it wasn't illegal, right? They saw a chance, a chance to get money, and they took it, which is what companies are always gonna do. Companies going company, y'all. <laughs> you know how we all say that? No, we don't. My question is, why didn't the government come up with regulations to make sure that the money for small businesses actually went to small businesses? It's like if you put down a bowl of food for a small dog, you have to get the big dog out of the room. Everyone knows that. Right? If you just ask the big dog not to eat the food, the dog's gonna be like, oh uh, yeah, I'll think about it, but I think better when I'm full. So let me just eat some of the food and then I'll let you know. So you see, instead of keeping the big dogs out, the treasury department just left the whole thing up to the banks. And then the banks did what the banks do, which is screw over the little guys. Four major banks are already facing a lawsuit alleging they prioritized bigger customers because those PPP loans yielded bigger fees for the banks. The program allows banks to prioritize existing customers, particularly those with large credit lines over small businesses or new applicants. Nearly 8,500 of J.P. Morgan's private and commercial bank customers who applied were assisted by what some called a concierge banking service. If you have 20 $25 million and you go to a large bank, the way that they're going to get your account is with white glove service that your corner sh shop just is not going to have. And that means that you don't wait on hold. Um, you don't go through a web portal that doesn't work. You call someone up who picks up the phone and scoots you to the front of the line. Yeah. You can't leave the loan decisions up to the banks. You can't let them take government's money and then decide who it goes to. Because unlike a government, a bank is a business. It's always gonna take care of its top customers first. So big companies weren't waiting in line to get loans. They had direct access to the cash. It's the same way Ivanka has direct access to Trump while Eric has to call and set up an appointment. By the way, Eric, they're always busy. They will always be busy. So that's what went wrong with the first round of small business loans. And hopefully, hopefully the Treasury Department's new rules for the second round of money will ensure that the loans go to the companies that actually need it the most. But there's another big aspect to the story that a lot of people are overlooking. Many small businesses in America are owned by women and black people. And you know what many black owned and women owned businesses don't have? Pre-existing relationships with banks. So if the banks didn't know you before coronavirus, you're definitely not gonna be on their radar now which is why experts fear that up to 90% of women and minority-owned businesses could be shut out of the loan program. Now, I don't know how you fix this program overnight, but if you're a woman or a minority who owns a small business, I suggest you start practicing your jump shot because that might be the only way you get some of this government cash. Every single industry in the world has been affected in some way by COVID-19. Retail stores have been shut down. Tourist sites have been closed. Barbers 
are buying those chia heads just to keep up their skills. And one industry that needs to remain open in order for us to survive is the food industry. But now the virus is coming for that too. The food supply chain is breaking. That's the warning in a full-page ad from Tyson Foods, released in the New York Times. It comes after one of the country's largest meat processors closed a massive pork processing plant in Iowa because of a coronavirus outbreak. A USA Today investigation found 150 of the nation's largest plants are in counties where the infection rate is spiking, threatening not only workers, but potentially the food supply. This morning, with beef increasingly scarce, President Trump promised to take action, signing an executive order under the Defense Production Act to ensure processing plants stay open and run at the maximum extent possible. You know, I'll say this about Trump. He is very clear about what his priorities are in life because he was warned for months about the pandemic coming to America and he did practically nothing. But you tell the man once that there could be a beef shortage and he springs into action like the world's hungriest superhero. Dun, 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 dun. But that's Trump, man. If there's one thing we know about him, it's that he loves meat. You know he must have been really disappointed when he heard that Meatloaf was gonna be on The Apprentice and it turned out to be an actual man named Meatloaf. Who the hell is this? I can't put gravy on this man. I mean, I sure as hell will try. But yes, few places in America have seen a higher rate of coronavirus cases than meat processing plants. And although there doesn't seem to be a danger to the food itself, in most of these facilities, the workers are quite literally putting their lives on the line. Processing plants can be a breeding ground for the virus because many workers spend their day side by side. You're not talking about 200 people, you're talking about several thousand people. We are very close. We can use a social distance at that place. One employee concealing their identity for fear of retribution tells us plant managers were asked why fewer employees were showing up, adding the virus was rarely mentioned, if at all. People start being uh, carried out of there. And so we, we were always asking our supervisors, basically, what is it that's going on here? This notice for a $500 attendance bonus enticed employees to keep working. The union representing workers says one month of requests for PPE were basically ignored. Employees tell us workers were given hair nets to use as face masks. A hair net? Come on, people, that is some bullshit. Workers were given hair nets to wear as face masks. Hair nets can't stop the virus. I don't even think hair nets can stop hair. I've eaten school lunch. And you know, it's really sad that these workers are being forced to keep the food chain going, but nobody's being forced to protect them while they do it. They need equipment to keep safe while doing their jobs. And if you eat meat, you especially should want these workers to be treated right. Because without them, the only way you're getting bacon is if you fight the pig yourself. We all know how that's gonna end. So. Troubles at meat processing plants is one problem. But there's also another problem that's messing up the food supply chain right now, and that's distribution. Because with everyone locked down and eating at home, the food that used to go to restaurants and schools has now got nowhere to go. Before the pandemic, by one estimate, 24 million cases of food were delivered every day to restaurants, schools, and large venues in bulk and to repackage it for sale in grocery stores takes time and money. With restaurants closed, demand for butter and cheese has dropped significantly. The farmers who can no longer get their products to restaurants and other customers are discarding millions of pounds of fresh fruit and vegetables. Bars and breweries tapping out, like Minnesota's Bauhaus Brew Labs, forced to dump 900 gallons of perfectly fine brewski down the drain as demand for draft beer dries up. Damn. They had to dump 900 gallons of craft beer down the drain. Right now, all over America, fraternity house flags are flying at half mast. Although it's not bad news for everyone. I mean, down in the sewers, the hipster rats are having the time of their lives. But these supply chain problems don't surprise me at all. I mean, of course, people don't eat the same way at home as they would in restaurants, right? Nobody at home is like, you know what I could do tonight, honey? I could have a seafood tower. Why don't you bring out one of those triple-decker trays that we always use for the seafood? And this gap between what factories and farmers are producing and what people are now eating isn't just messing up the food chain in the United States. No, it's happening all over the world. In fact, it's gotten so bad that one country is calling on all of its citizens to help out 
in a special way. Meanwhile, in Belgium, people are being asked to eat twice the amount of French fries, all in an effort to prevent food waste. According to research, Belgians already typically eat fries at least once a week. But potato farmers say if everyone doubles the amount of consumption, it could prevent nearly 750,000 tons of surplus potatoes from going to waste. Wow. Belgians are being asked to help eat 750,000 pounds of extra French fries. And that seems like a challenge, but if they can borrow some weed from Amsterdam next door, they can knock that out in like a day, tops. I'm not gonna lie. I get that this is a problem, but personally, being asked to eat more French fries, that would be my dream come true. Well, I mean, to give you the full story, my dream is that I'm eating extra French fries because J-Lo can't finish hers because she ate too many appetizers during our wedding's cocktail hour and then she wants to save some room for cake. But that's basically the dream. It's close enough. <laughs> but here's what I say. If Belgium can solve its food chain problems by asking people just to eat more French fries, then surely the United States of America can step up too. America, we're going through difficult times. Disease, lockdown, they even delayed the new James Bond movie. It's looking forward to that. But if there's one thing this crisis has presented to Americans, it's a challenge that we're uniquely prepared to face. Food waste. All over this great nation, food that was supposed to go to restaurants and school cafeterias is being thrown away because we can't eat in such huge quantities anymore. But we can't. The hell we can't, this is the USA. Man, we the country that invented supersizing, hot dog eating contests, and fighting to the death over a fried chicken sandwich. We've been training for this crisis our entire lives. So America, I need you to join with me and stuff your faces like your lives and your country depends on it. Because it does. USA, 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 USA. Thank you so much for that, Roy. I'm inspired and hungry. Before we go, though, please remember that the COVID pandemic has devastated communities around the world, but the International Medical Corps is helping these communities rebuild and recover. And if you are able to help and you would like to help, please donate whatever you can. If you'd like to support the response specifically here at home in New York City, please donate to the NYC Healthcare Heroes who are providing care packages to our healthcare workers, hospitals, and temporary medical facilities. Until next week, stay safe out there, wash your hands, and remember, be kind to your bedbugs. Right now, they're the only friends you've got. <laughs>